right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, my name is Katherine Weidert. I'm the communications manager at Audubon, Louisiana. Um, although we are unable to travel freely right now due to COVID-19, one bright yellow songbird has been taking flight across continents. We hope you enjoy a look into the species and learn how you can play a part in helping the canary of the swamp. Before we get started, we just have a few housekeeping items. Um, to reduce background noise, we have uh, muted everyone's lines. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, we will have a few minutes after the webinar to answer those questions. Um, let's get started. I would like to introduce today's speakers. First, we have uh, Katie Percy, who is an avian biologist at Audubon, Louisiana. And we also have Matt Johnson, who is the center director at Audubon Center um, and Sanctuary at Bidler Forest. So I'm gonna go ahead and shoot it over to them. Thanks, Catherine. Um, <clears throat> thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm Matt Johnson. Um, as Catherine said, uh, I'm in South Carolina. I work for Audubon, South Carolina. Uh, and I'm very fortunate enough to get to work a little bit with this really cool species and really appreciate you all taking, uh, taking the time to join us today. I'm sure that um, we hope you all are doing well, but I'm sure we all wish we could be out in the field looking for prothonotary warblers, but perhaps this is the next uh, best thing. Um, so hopefully maybe you'll learn something today and take it with you the next time you are, you are able to get out. Um, what we are going to do today is talk a little bit about, uh, about this bird, as you see on the slide here, um, a little bit about kind of the work that takes place in South Carolina and in Louisiana, <clears throat> and then a little bit about the research that's happened recently. It's kind of exciting uh, that, uh, that has to do with the migration around the species. But um, as Catherine said, please put your, in, any comments you have in the chat, um, or even if you just have stories or any, anything cool you wanna share with us about prothonotaries or about birds in general, we would love to hear. Um, and uh, so let's talk about prothonotaries. Um, I'm going to start, just go a, a little bit over about this species. You know, I, uh, for any of y'all that may be on here that know me, you know, I, I am a bird lover. I love all birds, but it's, I feel particularly grateful to get to work with prothonotaries. They're such a charismatic species um, in areas where they are abundant. They can be very easy to see, and oftentimes you get really close to them. Uh, they tend to not be very shy <clears throat> and they spend a lot of their lives close to the ground. So oftentimes you get to see them uh, close up. So, um, but one kind of, uh, one peculiar, peculiar thing about them is their name. And so uh, it, it seems like a good place to start. What is a prothonotary? How do you even say that word? Uh, prothonotary is how I have always learned it, uh, Katie. But I think uh, another pronunciation for that is actually prothonotary. Uh, and if you break that word down, prothonotary means the first notary, and it actually refers to, my understanding is it refers to a clerk or clerks that worked in the Roman Catholic Church that wore these bright yellow robes, and so that, uh, I guess, the reminiscent of this bird, and that's how it got its name. You know, other names that I have heard include uh, sort of the canary of the swamp or the golden swamp warbler, um, and to be honest, for talking about it with uh, <clears throat> a lot of different people, Golden Swamp Warbler might be easier uh, to remember, but Prothonotary is the name, uh, and, it is, and it is a unique name, and it is a, pr a pretty neat one. And they do use more than just swamps. Um, they are a wetlands-dependent species, but that wet, that the type of wetlands can be very different in terms of where we find these birds. Usually, where we combine trees and water is where we see them, but a lot of different kinds of wetlands. And one unique thing about them is that they nest in cavities, um, which is sort of unique among warblers. Of all the species of warblers that we have, only two nest in cavities. And the prothonotary is the only warbler in the Eastern United States that nests in cavities. So trivia question for today is, does anybody, um, any of y'all know where, uh, what is the other species of warbler that is a cavity nester other than the prothonotary warbler I've given you a hint as to where it might occur. If you know it, please put it in the chat. Don't cheat. Uh, don't, don't Google it. Um, we'll see, if, see if, how many of y'all know that. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention, and so it's a cavity nester. We're going to talk about more about cavities and about how you can actually uh, create artificial cavities for this species um, a little bit later on. The last thing I wanted to show y'all uh, is, or let you listen to, is the song. Because in addition to being a very bright bird, it has a very loud song. I'm going to try playing it on my phone here, and I'm hoping that y'all will be able to hear it. 
Um, but the mnemonic that we use, the kind of phrase that we use for this song is sweet, 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 and it's very loud and on the same, kind of on the same pitch. Y'all hearing this? Very pretty, very pretty sound uh, and a very pretty bird. So this is a little background information. Let's click on to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit about um, the difference between the male and female. Um, they are kind of similar, um, but have a little bit of differences. The male is generally a lot brighter overall, bright yellow um, all over its belly, up onto its throat, on top of its head, um, and then onto its uh, nape, the back of its neck. And that's for me, the way I, I mainly tell it from the females, the females are also very bright. This is the female on the right of the screen, um, <clears throat> but tend to be a little bit duller, especially around the head and on the back of the uh, back of the neck on the nape. They tend to be sort of more of like a, a greenish, uh, greenish yellow. Um, I, you might describe their, their, uh, th that color. Um, and then the males are the only ones that sing uh, for this species. And I think we have, um, I think we have another photo here of, uh, of a prothonotary, if you click to the next um, slide. Yes, yeah, sometimes kind of an interesting thing that we see with some of these birds is, especially it seems to me early in the spring, they show up with these uh, sort of dark patches on their foreheads. We aren't quite sure what that is. And I wondered if y'all, any of y'all uh, listening have ever seen a prothonotary with this. Um, but we like to point it out um, uh, because it can make it look like other kinds of warblers, like something like a Wilson's warbler which we don't see a lot here in South Carolina, but they tend to have a, uh, a black uh, cap on top of their head. Um, but kind of interesting, and we, we think it's maybe something they pick up in their, on the wintering grounds or during migration, aren't really sure, but you do see some of them with this kind of uh, uh, odd um, smudgy forehead. Next slide, please. And we'll look at the range of the prothonotary. So this, um, this map, it comes from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and from eBird. And so we're going to talk, you're going to see a couple maps um, related to eBird as we go along. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about using eBird at the end, but it's a great tool both for reporting birds that you're seeing and also learning about the distribution of birds and places to go birding. Um, this one shows an abundance map of prothonotary warblers, but actually is created from people like you and I submitting the sightings of birds that we're seeing. A couple of things I wanted to point out here. One, you can see the overall range of the prothonotary it tends to be in the eastern United States. In red shows the breeding uh, uh, abundance where it tends to be more, most common, the darker red where we see more prothonotaries um, on their breeding grounds. And then, um, well, and let me just mention for that, we see, we see a lot of them along the Atlantic coast, uh, obviously here in South Carolina, but also North Carolina, Virginia, up sort of uh, into the mid-Atlantic. And then not a lot in the Appalachians, but then widely distributed up the Mississippi River Valley. You see really dark red down there in Louisiana where Katy is. Um, and then the kind of yellowish green colors are the migration areas. And then blue is uh, where we see them in the winter. So this is a species we refer to as being a neotropical migrant because they do migrate out of the United States uh, in the winter. Uh, they spend their winters from sort of Southern Mexico uh, down through Central America and into South America. The blue ends here in Panama, but that doesn't mean that that's where the range uh, ends. They do occur uh, quite a bit down into Colombia. We're, in fact, well, Colombia is going to come up, come up again uh, a little bit later in, in the presentation, but it gives you a general idea of where we find them. And then the next slide um, talks a little bit about why we're working with them. And so they are very uh, charismatic species. They're very interesting. They're very fun to see, um, but that's not the only reason that Audubon is working with and has uh, chosen this as a priority species. Um, on the slide here, you uh, or slide here, and as I mentioned earlier, I said that they are sometimes called the canary of the swamp, and both in the way that they look, kind of that canary yellow color, but also um, sort of in the proverbial sense, like the canary of the coal mine, prothonotary warblers can be a good barometer of the health of our wetland ecosystems. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, um, they like to nest over standing water, and so there are, they are susceptible to 
changes in hydrology. So when we see the flow of water be altered or affected, that can actually affect prothonotaries and also affect what they eat. And that's the other kind of part of the equation when we think about them being the proverbial, proverbial canary. Um, if you look at the photo here, some of y'all probably recognize the insect in the mouth of this prothonotary, but it's a, a mayfly. And prothonotaries eat, do have a wide, uh, a wide variety in their diet. Um, they are insectivorous, like a lot of our warblers. Uh, and a lot of what they eat are what we would call aquatic macroinvertebrates. So bugs that crawl up out of the water and go through a metamorphosis, things like mayflies, dragonflies, um, uh, and, and other types. Um, some of those uh, insects are tied to water quality. Mayflies, for example, do, do much better in high quality water. And so, um, you know, again, uh, population of prothonotaries can also uh, help you inform, understand the population of um, maybe some of the invertebrates in a given ecosystem and can help you assess the overall health of the ecosystem. And then uh, quickly I'll mention too that uh, we in, in South Carolina and I think Katie y'all in Louisiana as well, um, we'll think about prothonotaries as, a, as what we call a responsibility species. And what I mean by that is that a high percentage of their global population occur in distinct geographic areas. For the Carolinas, about 20% of their global population uh, occurs in both of the Carolinas. And I think, Katie, I think you mentioned to me it's something like almost maybe 25%, 20 to 25%. Yeah, occur. 15 to 20%. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, so a high percentage occurring in those yeah. areas, meaning that we're, we feel sort of responsible for maintaining high numbers and high quality habitat mm -hmm. for these species. Unfortunately, though, like a lot of birds that are migratory, we're seeing uh, population declines continue. And so, Catherine, if you click to the next slide, we'll see uh, sort of a graph that's showing that decline based on the North American Breeding Bird Survey. So we see um, a 40% decline really since the start of the Breeding Bird Survey back in the 1960s at about one, a little over 1% per year over the last 50 years. Um, you know, some of the good news is that it's not, that decline is not as steep maybe as it was from the 60s through the 90s. Uh, and perhaps we think maybe that could be due to um, sort of widespread wetlands conservation efforts that have taken place in the United States. However, that decline is still occurring. We're not really sure why that is, but we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go throughout the presentation. You may see this, this graph come up again. So um, I, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Katie to kind of talk about how some of this work with prothonotaries got started in South, or I'm sorry, in Louisiana, mm -hmm. and that impacted a lot of the work that us in South Carolina and, and, and elsewhere did. So Katie, over to you. Great, thank you, Matt. And that was a wonderful introduction to the species. So as Matt mentioned in Louisiana, where a lot of this work began, <clears throat> we have two primary objectives, and one has been to actually enhance breeding habitat through community science. And then that second objective, understanding connectivity to non-breeding regions to inform a full life cycle conservation plan, we'll enter into that a little bit later in the presentation. Next slide, Catherine. All right, so as Matt already mentioned, the prothonotary warbler is a cavity nester, um, and they're what's considered a secondary cavity nester. So with that warbler bill, it's not strong enough to actually excavate their own cavity the way, say, a woodpecker can do. And that's the far right photo. You can see a prothonotary reusing a cavity that was drilled by a woodpecker. Um, alternatively, they may nest in hollowed out cypress knees or even just snags that have broken off and created that hollowed out space in the middle of a tree. Next slide, Catherine. All right, and in addition to those kind of natural cavities, they will also readily take to man-made structures. Um, the far left is a photo that I had emailed to me. It's actually a pair of prothonotaries that are nesting inside somebody's porch, inside of the glass case around their candle. Um, and in the second photo, you can see that it's actually the nestling that has hopped off of the candle um, and is still maintained inside of that case. And then with Audubon, we've also hosted a number of nest box building workshops so we can do possibly more complicated designs with um, out of wood. But then also this really simple design that just makes use of old juice cartons or milk cartons that have been cleaned out 
um, is very easy to put together, requires minimal materials, and we have put these out on study sites and prothonotaries will really readily take to those as well. And then the far right photo is just one of a PVC pipe. So we're looking into using more of those, but I know that that's been successful kind of across the species breeding range where others have used that material. More specifically in Louisiana, on the next slide you'll see what we've used a lot of. And so it's wooden boxes, but then we've also been using for a few years now these um, Tupperware containers. So they're pretty cheap and they're really easy um, to construct quickly and, and you can construct many of them. Um, so prothonotaries, as I mentioned, they've really readily taken to these. Um, the Tupperware doesn't last for years and years. We find that we're getting about two to three years out of each of these boxes and then we'll either replace the lids or replace the box entirely. Uh, just a couple of things to point out about these man-made boxes that we wanna stress is we use one and a quarter inch cavity holes and what that does is it allows prothonotaries in, but it excludes brown-headed cowbirds, which we can discuss a little bit more, but I'll stay short on that for time. Um, briefly though, the brown-headed cowbird is a nest parasitite, so they will lay their eggs in the nest of other host species, and sometimes that's actually to the detriment of the host species, species nestlings. Um, and then additionally, we will also predator guard our nest boxes. So on the far left, you can see that there's flashing below that wooden box. And then with the Tupperware boxes, you can see what that is, is actually a five gallon bucket where we've cut the rim off and inverted it. And both of those serve to keep mammalian and snake predators from accessing that, uh, the nest box from below. And then we'll also position these three to four feet away from vegetation, which usually prevents um, these predators from accessing from above. All right, next slide. And we certainly could not have done this alone. Um, there have been Eagle Scouts who have done nest box building as a part of their project and worked with their Boy Scout troops. We've worked with high school students and shop classes and undergraduate students, even graduate students, um, countless volunteers at this point, um, as well as interns and technicians. So in a tremendous amount of gratitude to everybody who's worked on this project in Louisiana throughout the years. And then on the next slide, you can see all of the sites that we have been either working on ourselves or collaborating with others. So that's a pretty good spread, we feel like, across South Louisiana. These sites um, span a few hundred acres all the way up to over a thousand acres in size. And if you look at the next slide, it just gives you an idea of what the vast majority of our sites kind of look like. Um, so they're cypress tupelo swamps and bottomland hardwood forest and frequently there can be some pretty drastic um, water level fluctuations, particularly after heavy rain events um, and it can make for some pretty difficult hiking but at the end of one of these days I always think it's worth it. I think this habitat is just gorgeous and I feel extremely privileged um, to get to spend so much time in it. Matt, I'll kick it back over to you to see how you feel about your study sites. Uh, likewise, um, and uh, we're, I feel fortunate as well. Um, we have primarily two study sites in South Carolina where we work, and um, this map is uh, perhaps not easy to see. You can't see the outline of South Carolina very well, but uh, sort of in the middle right of the screen, you can see Charleston right along the coast, which is a pretty well-known city uh, it's sort of um, centrally located in the coast of South Carolina and both of our study sites are about an uh, hour inland from there. Um, if you click the next one time you'll see a photo from our site where I'm fortunate enough to work. So this is the Audubon Center and Sanctuary at the Francis Byler Forest. It's a <clears throat> 18,000 acre Audubon Sanctuary. It's one of the larger Audubon Sanctuaries in the country. Um, and what's really unique about this site is uh, about a tenth of that, 1,800 acres, is original growth. Uh, so it's never been logged. If you uh, look sort of in the right middle of the screen uh, here, there's a large tree. That's a, a bald cypress tree in the neighborhood of about 1,000 years old. So um, I like to think about our site as, uh, as being one where <clears throat> 
it would have looked, it looks similar to prothonotaries today. It would look similar to prothonotaries 500 years ago. Um, and fortunately, we have a, a boardwalk uh, that goes out into the swamp. I would love to hear of any of any of our folks in attendance today perhaps have been there and uh, gotten to uh, gotten to walk this boardwalk. It's about a mile and three quarters. And I feel very fortunate because a lot of our field work, Katie, is actually done from the boardwalk or just off of the boardwalk. So not only do we have an easy, a relatively easy place to work, but we have a place that um, a lot of people get to experience this project and get to see these birds up close while they're visiting. Uh, we, we could be doing our field work and also interpreting with visitors or groups uh, while we're there. Um, so that's one of our study sites. Uh, the next one, if you click one, one more time, is, um, is quite different. And so that is kind of one of the interesting things is um, while they, these birds use wetland habitats, they can be very different. So um, our other study site is the old Santee Canal Park. It is a 200 acre park that's owned by our um, uh, state owned utility, Santee Cooper in South Carolina. And we've been working with the staff there for about the last four years to do some of the similar things that you have done, Katie, put up nest boxes, monitor the birds while they're here, ban the birds, and also do public um, banding demonstrations and uh, bird walks talking about these species uh, specifically. So thanks to all of our friends over at Old Santee Canal Park and their great work. Um, and on the next slide, I thought I just might mention a little bit about what we're doing, very similar to you, uh, to y'all, Katie. Um, a lot of our pro uh, our work with prothonotaries is uh, couched under the the um, this citizen this community science project that we call Project Profo. So, um, I think on the next slide, Catherine, please, there should be. Um, You'll, you'll see what I mean by Project Protho. Here we go, thank you. Um, and Protho is an acronym. I'm, I'm not gonna read that out, but you can read it for yourself. It's kind of, uh, kind of get, we get a chuckle out of it. It has been, been in place for several years and, we, and we, we've always liked it, so we kept it. But it is our community science project looking at prothonotary warblers, um, which has focused on, um, which is focused on uh, capturing, banding these birds, monitoring them at both of these different sites, uh, installing nest boxes, um, and doing a variety of different work, including public banding demonstrations. So if you can just, you just click through, um, I think I have a couple of different photos here showing um, some of our work with, um, with uh, youth groups and adult groups. So we've had, you know, hundreds if not thousands of people that have got to experience the banding process up close. We built nest boxes uh, for these birds that we put up at both sites. We've also worked with interns uh, over the last several years that have gotten to really uh, focus on this project. And so um, a lot of really cool work. I think a question that comes up a lot though, Katie, is sort of like, how do we catch these birds? Um, how does that process work? What is their nesting like? And then I know that kind of gets into some of our uh, tracking work that we've done over the last couple of years. So I'll let you take it over with, so, with sort of some of the nesting, how the nesting process works with this species. Okay, I will pick up on the next slide. So, and for anyone who's interested in monitoring a nest, these are just some of the, the phenology. So the basic timeline that you can expect. Um, as Matt already mentioned, the prothonotary is a migratory species. So they start to arrive in North America in late March. I mean, particularly at these like lower latitudes where we are in Louisiana. So it'll take them a little bit longer to get further north to those breeding sites. Um, and then their clutch size is typically three to six eggs. Um, I know on our sites, we see far more on average, at least in that very initial clutch, um, five eggs. And then maybe in each subsequent clutch, one less egg than the first, um, than the one prior. The female is the sole incubator, so the male does not assist in that process, and it takes about 12 to 14 days before the eggs hatch. And then that nestling period is just 10 to 11 days, and we frequently are seeing these chicks um, fledging, so leaving the nest box right at 10 days um, post-hatching, which is just incredible to think about they're already approximating the weight of the adult. So they're almost full grown. Their feathers are just continuing to grow at that point. And then the parents will continue to feed up to 35 days after fledging. So that includes when the parents are potentially starting a whole second clutch. And we've seen as many as three successful clutches within a single season, which is also pretty incredible to think about. Uh, all right, next slide. So just a little bit more about what we've been documenting as, um, 
at each of our nest boxes. So we have been assessing provisioning rates and food items, so those prey items that our adults are bringing into their nestlings. Um, and we've been doing that primarily up to this point with video camera. And, and Matt had already discussed a little bit of this. We're just interested in one, assessing kind of habitat quality um, and then making those comparisons across not just our study sites, but across the breeding range. And we've seen our partners at Virginia Commonwealth University who have shown differences in nestling growth rate and prey items <clears throat> when they make the comparison between their wet and dry sites. So we were interested if similar things are occurring here in Louisiana, and you're probably been interested in that as well in South Carolina. Um, all right, next slide. And these are these photos are just showing how we achieve that, how we collect nestling growth rate, and it's by weighing the nestling twice during the nesting cycle. Um, and I just want everyone to know that this process takes um, truly just a minute or two. So it's a quick wait. We will band the individuals, and you can see with the chick that's on the scale that has a band on its right leg. Um, the leg is almost full grown at that point. So their leg won't get any wider um, and that band will never constrict their leg. And that band will stay on that chick for the rest of its life. Um, but yeah, so weighing them twice within the nesting cycle gives us nestling growth rate. Like I said, we quickly put them back in the nest box and it's a bit of an old wives tale that parents will abandon their chicks if they've been touched by humans. Um, most birds don't actually have a really strong sense of smell and we have never seen a nest box abandoned because of this kind of nest box checking or quickly weighing the chicks on any of our sites. Okay, so that is now bringing us into the second primary objective that we have had, which is to understand connectivity to these non-breeding regions to inform that full life cycle conservation. And as Matt already showed you, where the population has been experiencing a decline at least since the 60s and probably before that. So historically, it looked like that was quite correlated with the loss of breeding habitat. And Catherine, if you can click one more time. And then click one more time because I'm going to get the next line to show up. All right. So, but then more recently, it looks like that decline is correlated with the loss of mangrove forest, um, which is happening at an alarming rate. And that is really the habitat that this species continues to utilize throughout the rest of its um, annual life cycle. And that non, during those non breeding season periods. All right, so that really kind of has spurred our question about specifically where prothonotaries are going when they are not here. I'm gonna let this graphic play through a couple of times. Um, this again is using eBird data, which Matt has also already introduced. It's community science, so it's massive data that's being submitted by individuals and then researchers and <clears throat> analysts with um, Cornell and with this project have produced just some amazing graphics for many species. So you can go to eBird.org and find similar graphics for other species. And what we're just showing is that influx of the prothonotary warbler into Eastern North, North America during the summer breeding months and then completely vacating by September, October, November, and they don't occur in the United States anymore during the, the rest of the fall and winter months. And then here we see them coming back into the States during the breeding season and then exiting again. So if we go to the next slide. All right, so before our you know, migratory tracking research really began, the question remained, we know where the breeding range is and approximately where the wintering range is, but we wanted to know more specifically kind of how the species is distributed across the um, Central and South America during those non-breeding season. And a bit of, next slide, Catherine. So a bit of why that's a little difficult to get at is just because, again, they're focusing on these wet forests in Central and South America, which can be extremely difficult to, to traverse. So this is a photo that I took in the Yucatan, and then if you look at the very next photo, it's one that my supervisor and uh, Eric Johnson took in Panama. So you can imagine this is extremely difficult to hike one quickly through and then if you're trying to bird, so looking up with binoculars at the same time is nearly impossible. 
All right, next slide, Catherine. Okay, so one of the ways that we are tracking such a small migratory warbler throughout the year is using a geolocator. And so this is just one of a few tracking devices that are tiny enough and lightweight enough to be put on a bird that weighs, you know, 12 to 15 grams. So the amount of about five pennies. Um, so you wouldn't want to put anything too heavy on a prothonotary that's going to actually affect their ability to fly and migrate successfully. So these um, geolocators are less than half a gram in weight. So they're less than three to 4% of the bird's overall body weight. And they're data loggers. So they're not wire wirelessly transmitting information. Um, it's all being maintained on the unit, which also means that we have to recapture that individual a year later, remove that tracking device, plug it into a computer to then recover all of the data that's being maintained on it. And a geolocator is actually pulling in ambient light levels and it's from day length that you can get the approximate latitude and solar noon that you can acquire the approximate longitude, which ultimately, ultimately gives you the approximate location of the individual. And it's not the pinpoint level ac accuracy that we would love um, that say GPS has, but unfortunately GPS tracking devices are still just too heavy to put on prothonotaries. All right. Next slide. So first we have to catch a, catch a prothonotary. And how does one do that? Um, well, you do have to be federally and state permitted. So not everybody can just hop out and catch birds in their backyard. They are protected um, and we have been permitted to do this research. And then we use a very convincing decoy. And I say very convincing because actually prothonotaries don't seem terribly picky. This is the decoy that I've been using for a few years. It's a yellow rubber ducky. I think it's appropriate because it floats um, in the swamp. Uh, Matt, <laughs> would you want to come in and let me know what you've been using in South Carolina? Yeah, we. Uh, while I, I am envious of that and may consider getting my own rubber ducky for the floating purposes, I will say we use something a little bit Nicer, we have a, a great artist here in South Carolina and I realized um, that I have it with me, so I pulled it out, but he, yeah. he made a, a hand carved decoy. So this, uh, it has a little hole in the bottom that we can, we'll stick a little uh, wooden dowel and put it on a, on the handrails that you saw in the photo earlier at Beidler, mm -hmm. and it'll sit right next to the net. And so uh, it's a uh, very nice, very thankful Pat Campbell. It, uh, Pat Campbell, if you're listening, thank you so much. He's made us a couple of these, so we use those, but I think, to your point, anything, just about anything yellow uh, at the right time of the year will work. I've even heard of things like tennis balls, but I like the rubber ducky uh, that you use. Oh, yeah, and your decoy is very nice. Um, okay, well, and then we will also uh, use song playback. So Matt did play the male song. They're highly territorial when they're on their breeding grounds. And so using a speaker and broadcasting the song of a prothonotary within a given male's territory will elicit this territorial response. And they will fly in and there you see the same location where we caught a male prothonotary. Um, me and my technicians were always very close. So we see the second that this bird hits the net and then we're extracting them seconds later. And if you click to the next slide, There's, and I apologize, there's a little bit of a delay, at least on my end. So in this one, you'll see, this is Lauren Solomon. She worked with us for several summers, a year, a couple years ago. Um, she's pulling a prothonotary <clears throat> out of the net right after they've been captured. And then what we do is, in addition to potentially putting a geolocator on an individual, we will band them. And in this photo, you can see that there are also color bands on the, um, on the individual, which are unique per study site. And that way, in the future, we don't have to keep recapturing the individual to know who they are. That unique color band combination will allow us to identify them just as they're um, flying about their territory and their usual behavior. And then also, when an individual returns a year later, it gives us annual return rates. And actually, Catherine, if you click to the next slide, So here you can see the bird not in hand in a tree and, and it 
probably does require binoculars to actually be able to tell the color band colors in combination on the legs or like this these photos that have been taken by John Hartring, um, a really nice camera. Um, and then in addition to giving us annual return rates, we can also identify if it's an individual that's wearing a geolocator and needs to be recaptured. All right, so if you click to the next slide. This is just showing how a geolocator is put on a prothonotary. So it's actually around their legs. It's considered a leg loop harness. And then the unit will actually sit, you can see on the right photo, on their back. And there's that little light rod that's going to pull in the light level data. And in the next slide, I have a video that hopefully will play. It's showing <clears throat> us putting a geolocator on a prothonotary. So the leftmost video, if you click again, Catherine should start playing through. And we're using a crochet hook to loop that harness around the bird's leg. And it's always a little difficult to get a really good video of this. So Catherine, if you click again, it'll play the middle video. And we're just going to pull the wing out so that you can see where the, again, where the geolocator rests on the bird's back and you can see that little white rod. And then if one more is the next video releasing a bird after it's been outfitted with geolocator. And you can see that they fly, um, fly away really quickly. And then we'll usually continue to monitor them for several minutes to make sure that the bird actually returns to their normal foraging and um, feeding behavior. All right, next slide. Okay, the very first time that this was ever done, so the very first time a geolocator was ever put on a prothonotary warbler was right here at Breck's Bluebonnet Swamp Nature Center in Baton Rouge. That was in the fall of 2013 by um, Eric Johnson and Jared Wolf with the Louisiana Bird Observatory and actually <clears throat> um, the Baton Rouge Audubon Society. So our local chapter at that time kind of a, is where this research was initiated and as you can imagine so you can go ahead and let that next uh gif play catherine um i wasn't yet with audubon i wasn't back working in the state but i know from talking with eric johnson that this is how he and jared then spent the remainder of 2013 and into 2014 waiting to see if um any of the birds that they had put a geolocator on returned and so it was a a small sample. They had three geolocators. It was just that initial um, pilot year of just kind of proof of concept. So if you go ahead and click to the next slide. Um, and here's a photo of John Hartring. So he's at Blue Bonnet Swamp most days. And if you're in this area, then you probably met him. Um, and he did in fact identify that that one of the prothonotaries um, returned on the 24th of March in 2014. All right, Kat, Catherine, if you click one more time. And everybody affiliated with the project at that time did their happy dance. And then click one more time. All right, so, and then we here we have a photo. They weren't actually able to catch that prothonotary on the 24th, but they did catch them on the 25th. We have Jared holding the prothonotary on the left, and then Eric Johnson um, holding the geolocator right after it had been removed from a prothonotary. Um, and let's see, so go ahead and click to the next slide, Catherine. Um, and a part of the initial concern is, okay, well, we got the bird back and we got, and the bird was still carrying the geolocator. Um, hopefully it has data. And this one individual that was recovered um, in, 20, in, in 2014 did in fact maintain data. And this is what they discovered. So that individual left Baton Rouge, looks like it stopped off on the coast of Louisiana before making this flight across the Gulf. It did not circumnavigate, but flew across the Gulf of Mexico in one flight. Um, went up through the Yucatan and then 
crossed over to Cuba before dropping down to Jamaica and then ultimately on November 15th making it to Colombia. And then Catherine, if you want to click through the next series. And then by March, this individual was returning in the spring all the way back to its breeding grounds in Baton Rouge, Louisiana at this 100 acre preserved um, Cypress Tupelo Swamp that's like right in the middle of Baton Rouge. So a very kind of urban setting. Um, all right, and then click again, Catherine, for just kind of the summary of that trip. So it was Louisiana to Columbia. It took three and a half months for fall migration to complete, and then a really rapid three-week return migration. So in total, that's somewhere around 5,000 miles, seven countries, and three major water crossings. Um, I know we're getting kind of close on time, but I believe Matt has a similar story from South Carolina. Yeah, and um, you know, we've been talking about this and doing this work for oh. a couple of, you know, five, Go, sorry, go ahead. Matt, yeah, just to complete, for anyone who wants to read specifically about that bird, I'll just highlight that the paper was published in the Journal of Field of um, Ornithology. And again, the authors are Jared Wolf and Eric Johnson. Um, so you can, and we can share these and we'll, we're, we're making a recording of the presentation. So you'll be able to look back at that. All right, Matt, apologies. No worries. No, I was just gonna say that, you know, we've been uh, doing this work for several years now, four or five, and um, when I see these data, I still get chills because um, it's almost impossible to believe um, that these birds are, are making these amazing trips. And so we were inspired by the work done in Louisiana. And so in 2014, um, you know, launched our own sort of geolocator portion of this project. And ours also focused on one individual bird. So for a lot of reasons that I won't get into, uh, we had planned to put out multiple units and we ultimately only were able to put out one. And, you know, I think a point to mention, Katie, is that, you know, when these birds undertake this migration, it is the, you know, it is the um, most uh, dangerous part of their annual life cycle and they don't all survive from year to year. Um, and so, you know, when you do these kinds of work and you're trying to recover these little tiny units, which we do have to recover to get data from, you usually put out, a, you know, five to 10 and hope to get a couple of them back. So we, um, we, for a lot of reasons, we did not do that. We ultimately only put out one and um, like Geodad, we, we gave our, this bird a nickname, uh, Longshot, since we only had one geolocator. Um, and you can actually see, it's not really easy to see in this photo, but if you look on its back where the kind of the greenish yellow meets the blue, you can see just the tip of the geolocator. Um, but this photo was taken in, in, um, in July of 2014, right before we deployed the unit. Uh, and amazingly, um, this individual did return. We were able to recover it in April of 2015. And, um, and so Longshot came back to Bidler Forest. And if you click to the next slide, you'll see a, um, a map uh, somewhat similar to, um, or here, here, here's a photo of us recovering that unit. Tiny, this tiny little device on this tiny little bird that uh, undertook this really long trip and gives us some amazing insight into what their migration is like. And you can see uh, similarly uh, a trip a little different than Geodad, but same general idea, um, crossing the Gulf in one nonstop flight. Um, think about that for just a moment. That's 500 miles. They're doing that trip at night. That probably bleeds over in today. Um, that little bird that weighs five pennies uh, making that flight is incredible. Um, mm -hmm. across, across in the Caribbean down to Central America and eventually this bird also making its way down to Colombia as well. This geolocator died in February um, of 2015, so we don't have that return trip, but a difference similarly to Geodad of about 5,000 miles. And, you know, I think you said it, um, Katie, but similarly to, to Geodad, uh, Longshot, he returned to the same exact place, literally a, a, a half an acre, a quarter of an acre site. We caught him in the same spot um, in 2015 that we caught him to deploy the unit in 2014. So not only this 5,000 mile trip, but um, we call that, I think we call that site fidelity, right? So coming back right. to that, Incredible. Thing, not only to buy their forest, but literally to the same half acre. And I, I think you've told me that some birds have even, you've had birds use the same cavity from one year to the next. And that's just uh, almost that's unfathomable. Incredible. Yeah, it is. So I know uh, we're, we could probably talk about this forever, but we're, we're right. running long and I know we want to get to the really exciting part of the research. So I think all is to say is that these initial uh, sort of studies got us into 
wanting to do a more concerted effort with a lot of different partners. And so I know you want, you want to talk about that. Correct. Um, yeah, and probably what a lot of people tuned in um, for. So actually, if you go back one more, Catherine. So apologies again for the delay. Okay, so this is just a photo of an oven bird, um, similar geolocator research that's been done, and you have the northern breeding population um, in two different sites, and it's showing that the population throughout the entire annual life cycle appears to be maintaining the separation in this eastern population and the more western population. So our question <clears throat> is kind of what's going on with the prothonotary across the breeding range because you know, we only have basically anecdotal stories from single individuals from Louisiana and South Carolina, but we wanted to do this much more concerted effort across the breeding range. All right, next slide. In so in 2014, a prothonotary working group was actually established and, and with one of those primary objectives being to answer kind of this question of migratory connectivity. Many partners, as you can see, several Audubon offices, but then also a lot of universities and their graduate students um, <clears throat> and some conservation organizations in Central and South America as well. Next slide. Okay, so with that more concerted effort, there were a total of 146 geolocators deployed, and that's between 2013 and 2016. And that includes in Wisconsin, Ohio, Virginia, South Carolina, Arkansas, and Louisiana. So we feel like a pretty good spread across the breeding range. Um, and then what you have in the next, that third column, it's showing the number retrieved, and I want to stress with data, um, is 34. So it is, it does, you know, it's substantially lower than the number deployed. But what's going on there is, as Matt mentioned, we don't see 100% uh, return of individuals. So at best, we're looking at about 50% on each of our study sites, sometimes a little bit lower. So we don't get every geolocator back. We could hope for 50%, but even those that return, sometimes we are unfortunately unable to recapture individuals and or we just don't actually relocate them. Um, also, we did retrieve some geolocators that didn't actually have data on them. And this paper culminated in the one that is already shown on the screen. So Chris Tonra um, is lead author and, you know, kudos to him and much appreciation for leading this um, publication. And then also I need a shout out to Mike Hallworth who helped with the geolocator analysis. So that's actually quite a bit trickier than you might initially think. And Mike did all the heavy lifting on that. So uh, major kudos to his expertise in pulling him in. All right, next slide. All right, so what we have on the right is one of the maps produced from that geolocator analysis. And what you can see is there is some east-west separation in the breeding population. So those eastern breeding sites do kind of take that eastern route down to Florida, some stopping off in Cuba before ultimately converging in Central America. And then the other Eastern or more Western breeding population um, primarily traveled south along the Mississippi Flyway. It looks like everybody also took these direct flights across the Gulf instead of circumnavigating. Um, and then stopping off in the Yucatan in Central America. And then Catherine, if you click to the next slide, All right, the map on the left is showing that ultimately it does appear that 88% of the birds that we tagged um, converged in Colombia. And actually, so that's showing a little bit of the blue. So the darker blue is like the heat, the um, degree of probability increases that that's where those individuals occurred. Um, and that's a little more inland than we were expecting. Also just the idea that from across the breeding range, you have individuals converging in an area that is approximately one fifth the size of that breeding range um, was just sort of shocking. That is something that we definitely didn't know before we started this research. 
Um, and then if you look at the maps on the right side, what you have is first in map A, it's the mean stopover duration. So that's the number of days that individuals were staying in those Central American locations. Um, and increasing, so darker colors indicates that they stayed in those locations for longer periods of time. And then in map B, you have the number of individuals that <clears throat> stopped over. So you can see that a lot of individuals stopped off in the Yucatan, as well as kind of the Nicaragua, Honduras border, as well as Costa Rica and Panama. Um, and then in map C, there's the breeding populations. So that's from the six different study sites where we were deploying geolocators. And again, you can see that most study sites traveled through the Honduras, Nicaraguan border, as well as the Costa Rica, Panama area. So really highlighting some areas of important um, stopover habitat, as well as ultimately this overwintering location in Colombia. And I do want to point out that that's still like a wet forested area in inland Colombia. It's the Magdalena River Valley. And based on these results, we think that specific conservation uh, efforts targeting some of these non-breeding locations can actually benefit most of the breeding population. Uh, all right, next slide, Catherine. And if we briefly just take a closer look at what's been going on in Colombia more recently. So in 2016, the government of Colombia did sign a peace accord with the rebel group known as the FARC. And that brought to end six de decades of conflict that claimed hundreds of thousands of lives. Um, and it was a historic agreement that earned a Nobel Peace Prize for Juan Santos, the country's president at the time. And so that's all well and good, of course. But <clears throat> in the aftermath, it has been reported that almost as soon as the FARC fighters vacated their forest strongholds, some miners and loggers did move in, and that an estimated 1 million acres of tree cover have been removed in the were removed in that year after the peace agreement. And so that's an estimated 40%, 46% increase in forest clearing from 2016. So that's, that's rather alarming and something to be aware of. All right, Catherine, next slide. All right, and just a little bit about what Audubon is doing and kind of where we can go from here. So we do have a migratory bird initiative as well as an international alliance program. And both aim to build partnerships um, and increase network engagement across the hemisphere with a focus on the most important places that birds rely on, again, throughout their annual life cycle. And so just one specific way that we can help is to support ecotourism as an alternative to some of this extractive industry. Um, and really in Colombia, that shouldn't be such a hard sell because there are over 1900 bird species in that country alone. Um, and then just to kind of pose another quiz question, does anyone know which country hosts more species of bird than Colombia does? And I haven't been able to monitor the chat a whole lot, um, but I'll check back in. All right, so I'm seeing um, quite a few people maybe guessing at Ecuador and Brazil. And just to go ahead and answer that question, it's actually none. So Colombia does host the most species of birds um, in the world for a single country. That includes 200 migratory species, 155 threatened species, as well as 79 endemics. So species that only occur in that area. Okay, Matt, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it back to you with five minutes to go for what else um, kind of community science can do. Right, and I'm gonna be very brief, but first of all, great trick question. Um, that's a good one. You almost got me on that earlier in the week when we were testing, <laughs> testing this. Uh, I'm gonna be very brief because we've had, we've had a lot of good questions and we're gonna to try to get to yeah. just a few of them in the time that we have, but a lot of people ask sort of like what you can do to help prothonotaries and, and we've been talking about eBird and I just wanted to mention it because it's such a, I think it's such an easy thing to do. It's free. Um, you can download an app. You can go to the website. Um, Audubon partners with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology on a lot of things related to eBird. This map just shows you at very quick glance so far 
this year, really from about mid-March to now, uh, the number of profanatory warbler sightings uh, in the southeastern United States. You can see a lot of people are using it. It's easy to do if you ever go out birding, you can use the app to record what you uh, are seeing or consequently, if you're also curious about what local places there are to go birding, you can use eBird as a resource without having to have an account. But it is free, it's easy to set up. Um, you don't have to be an expert to log uh, sightings in eBird and there actually is sort of a filter process um, so that if you, uh, you, know, you think you're seeing something, you're not sure, you submit it, there are volunteers within eBird that are actually sort of filtering through that data. So it's a great community science resource uh, that I definitely wanted to mention. And I know, Katie, you have at least one that you'd like to mention that people can also use. Mm -hmm. On the next slide. Yes. All right, and so this is just another great one to be aware of. This is also by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and it's nestwatch.org. Um, there you can also submit your own nest record data. You can also search by species and <clears throat> and download plans for how to build specific nest boxes per species. Doesn't have to just be the prothonotary, anything that's appropriate in your area, your neighborhood, your yard. Um, and again, just a, a great community science database. So all, all, both that and eBird have just been wonderful. Okay, I'll leave that. Um, and with the little bit of time that we have left, I do want to take questions and go ahead and highlight briefly our acknowledgments. So of course, many funding sources. This is just for Louisiana and South Carolina over the years, as well as our study sites and collaborators who have allowed access to state park and national park and private lands, um, geolocator sponsors and interns and technicians. So as you can see, tons of people over the years. And then another shout out to all of our co-authors on the paper that we were highlighting and for everybody allowing us to present that data today. Um, okay, so I don't know if we're getting the boot exactly at um, an hour or if we have time to field a few questions. And I will, I should just quickly say too, and you said it for, for Louisiana, but South Carolina, so many volunteers, so many people that have helped uh, uh, in the banding process, uh, helping us put on geolocators, um, funding. I mean, it's just too many to name, but super thankful for all the all the interest and work and support for the work in South Carolina. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I see a few. Um, I see a few questions that have been sent to me from the chat, and I at least one I, I could quickly ask um, that just popped up on my phone here that I thought maybe be a good one. Somebody said, "How long does it take up to catch a prothonotary warbler once you put out the rubber duck decoy?" Can you answer that relatively quickly? Um, I mean, usually if it's early in the season, like I said, highly territorial males, a few minutes. I never broadcast playback and agitate the birds for longer than a few minutes. And if they don't seem to be responding, then I'll just move, kind of move on to the next territory. That's a good one. Okay. I'll ask another quick one. Are they, are they, do they show site fidelity on their wintering grounds? and wondering if they take the same migratory path at each year. I've gotten that question before. Oh, yeah, no, that is a good question, huh? So we've only ever deployed a geolocator on a single individual for one year. So we don't actually per individual have that migratory route um, for subsequent years. Um, and then, I don't know. I mean, given that they they ultimately are concentrating into such uh, such a small region, I would assume that they're you know on the wintering grounds they're returning to similar locations. But the kind of uh, territoriality and fidelity to those sites, I honestly don't know how specific it is. I can't imagine it's as precise as it is to their breeding grounds and their nest box or their cavity. I don't know, Matt, do you know? No, I think you're probably right. I think that a lot of them probably use the same general routes, but it's so hard to say when, you know, uh, so much of their migration sometimes is impacted by weather systems and, and winds. And um, it's a difficult question to answer. I would imagine though, similarly, that they do show relatively site fidelity to their, to their wintering grounds, maybe not as much so during the breeding season. Um, I'll, I'll ask another quick question. I'm curious, you know, because y'all use a lot of nest boxes and this question came up. Do y'all clean out nests after um, 
after the nestlings have fledged before and, and so that the birds could potentially use it again? I know this question comes up with things like bluebirds and sure. other nesters. Yeah, exactly. And I do get that question a fair amount. We opt to clean it out. If we catch it in time between nesting cycles, we clean it out. Um, just because sometimes there's mites or there may be some bugs and stuff left behind. Um, but on occasion, if we don't get there in time, we have seen that they just re-nest on top, but they're not going back in the same exact um, nest cup. They're always, the female seems to always be building a new nest on top of the old nest. Yeah, and that's kind of what we suggest too, is if you're, if you're monitoring it and you're keeping an eye on it and you know that they've left and they haven't started to rebuild, it's okay mm -hmm. to clean it out. If you're not sure, I always suggest to people, just leave it and that's including a bluebird nest in your yard. You never quite, if you're not, if you're not sure, better to leave it um, at least for a little while and keep an eye on it. Let's Matt, see. Yeah, what do you think? Have you been watching them? I'm um, opening the chats and scanning. Yeah, somebody, so there, I did see one. Are, are there any changes to prothonotary warbler migration uh, with climate change? What do you think about that? Well, like a lot of species, I mean, we're seeing differences in dates, right? So earlier arrival dates. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, it, it also takes time for some of that to really be, to culminate over, over the years. So from one year to the next, the, the differences may not be that extreme. Um, but certainly something that many scientists are paying attention to. And, and we have Audubon's climate report that is showing some of those broader scale changes that are occurring across a host of species, right? Yeah, it's such a complex question. I know it's one we all want to know the answer to, and it applies to all these birds that migrate, and, and even the ones that don't. How are they being impacted? But it's such a big picture question. For some species, we know a little bit more maybe than others, and, um, you know, for these birds that move across these vast areas, we're trying to understand what's happening, you know, sort of on their breeding grounds when it comes to a changing climate and food supply and the way mm -hmm. even you know, how the plant, when the, the plant phenology, when they leaf out and when the insects are feeding on them and are the birds right. able to get that same supply? It's so complex. It's a, it's a great question. And I know that's one we're all thinking right. about, um, but and it's so hard to answer sort of even from one year to the next. Exactly. I agree with you. And whether or not some of those processes get out of sync and it's, you know, to the detriment of nesting success. But yeah, like you said, it just takes, it takes time and repeat years of data collection to really see how that's playing out. Right. Um, another good question here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it also occurs to me, we, for those of you that have stuck with us through this entire time, we never answered our first trivia question about cavity nesting warblers. And I saw right a lot of people put the right answer in the chat, but it's the Lucy's warbler, which is yeah. a Western species of warbler, kind of of the uh, Southwest. Um, I don't know that I have actually ever seen a West or a Lucy's warbler. I don't know if you have Katie, but. Um, no, I was in the area, but I did never find one. Yeah. Uh, one thing that you and I talked a little bit about as a question, it doesn't, hasn't necessarily come up, but um, have you, you, it sounds like you've gotten to see or work, have you, have you gotten to work with prothonotaries on their wintering grounds or spend any time um, in the mangroves looking for them? No, I mean, I haven't. Um, I, I've been to the Yucatan because I had the photo um, from there, but I haven't been to Colombia, which would be amazing. Now, we do have partners in the working group who are located in Colombia and um, professors at Virginia Commonwealth University who have done work in Panama um, as well as Colombia. So we are beginning to collect data in those regions and have some ground truthing done for what this geolocator analysis has turned up. Um, so, so certainly more to come, um, but I, and I really hope that additional work is really concentrated now in some of these presumably critical stopover locations as well as this Magdalena River Valley of Columbia. Yeah, a lot of, a uh, lot of exciting future research that hopefully perhaps involves some trips down to Central and South America. Um, 
a question came up uh, and it was one I think that um, we uh, talked a little bit about when we connected earlier this week, which is putting up nest boxes and if people would be likely to attract a nest box or a prothonotary warbler if they had a box up maybe in their yard or in their neighborhood, if it were near water. Do these birds nest kind of in more suburban, urban settings uh, if those are adjacent to bodies of water? Well, and not just bodies of water, right? So it still has to be kind of a forested habitat. Um, so I, you know, we know of locations in Baton Rouge, which as I mentioned is very urban and very developed and in some people's homes in neighborhoods that have still like a bayou um, and some forest cover snaking through the neighborhood or adjacent to the neighborhood do in fact have prothonotaries nesting near their backyard in a cavity or on some other structure um, near their property. So it's certainly a potential. Um, but you still have to have some of that habit, that appropriate habitat for this species. But other cavity nesters in our area, Carolina wrens, Carolina chickadees, um, quite common in our urban backyards. And so houses that are appropriate, appropriate for prothonotaries um, could also host a Carolina chickadee or a Carolina wren. What about your area, Matt? Same. And, um... I think I, I know a few people that have had success um, uh, sort of in maybe their, what they might call their yard, but it's usually adjacent to a body of water. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, if, if, if the prothonotaries are in that area and there aren't an abundance of natural cavities, that sometimes they will maybe venture a little bit further away to go into some of those areas. Um, so I think it always can't hurt to put out a nest box. Um, you know, I think, as you said, if the prothonotaries don't use it, generally a Carolina wren or a chickadee or some other cavity nesting bird will. And um, a lot of our cavity nesting birds, I think, uh, you know, they maybe don't have as many cav cavities as existed, you know, 50 years ago. So um, one of the re reasons bluebirds have rebounded, right, is because of their, of us putting up nest boxes. And so I think it's a good thing to do, but I think to your point, you, you do need to be at least close to appropriate habitat. Um, and I guess just a closing thought for nest box location, because I see that someone just asked about appropriate height. Um, we're putting ours on top of six foot T post, but uh, I know we have to be aware in our area that the water level, like I said, it can fluctuate quite a bit. Um, so you don't want to put it so low that a change in water level might inundate a nest. Um, ours are at a height that we can still check them, but you can put them higher. I've certainly seen prothonotaries and natural cavities um, significantly higher, 12 feet or higher in the, in the air um, that I can't actually check. And then, so I, Catherine said we needed to go ahead and cut it off at 10 after, but I'm not sure if we can maintain some of the comments and we can either respond separately or if anybody wants to reach out to us individually, um, we can respond via email or on Twitter or any of the other um, platforms where we can be reached. Yeah, and I would just say thank you to all of you. Great questions, I appreciate your interest. Um, I know we didn't get to everybody's, but yeah, as, as Katie said, we're happy to follow up. Um, and uh, you can reach us through any of the, any of the means uh, or any of the points of contact listed here. And if we, we can, we can try to reach out to some of you individually to get your questions answered. But thank you so much for uh, your interest in uh, prothonotary warblers. Thank you to Matt and Katie for um, doing this for us. And like they said, if y'all have any questions, you can, um, if you want to email Louisiana at Audubon.org or South Carolina at Audubon.org. Um, also, the webinar is being recorded um, and will be posted on la.audubon.org. Um, and then also, if you go to the National Audubon Society's Facebook page, um, it'll be there as well once this is all over. So thank you all for joining us. Stay safe.